As someone who appreciates in-depth reporting so you're smarter about your day, consider a bed that helps you get smarter about your sleep at night. It's time to sleep next level with the Sleep Number Smart Bed. You deserve a bed that gives you a sleep experience like no other. Effortlessly adjusting and responding to you. Learning how you sleep so you learn to sleep better. Night after night. Sleep next level. Unlock your unique potential with a smart bed that can perform as well as you. And now, don't miss Sleep Number's biggest sale of the year where all beds are on sale. Save 50% on the Sleep Number Limited Edition Smart Bed, plus special financing for a limited time. Only at Sleep Number Stores or SleepNumber.com. See store for details. ACAST powers the world's best podcasts. Here's a show that we recommend. What is The Briefing Room? It's a behind-the-scenes look at how the criminal justice system works and the lives of the people within that system. If you love true crime, well, these are the real people who do the job every day of making sure justice is served. Hi, I'm Detective Dave. I'm Detective Dan. Together, we have decades of experience in local law enforcement, a profession that we think is often misunderstood. So we're going to explore how to do it right, and we won't shy away from when it's done wrong. These are stories you'll hear nowhere else. Unique, frank, and unvarnished. From the team that brought you Small Town Dicks, this is The Briefing Room. Episode 1 drops on August 30th. We'll meet you in The Briefing Room. ACAST helps creators launch, grow, and monetize their podcasts everywhere. ACAST.com Hello there. Welcome to episode number 581 of Smart Podcast Trashy Books. I'm Sarah Wendell, and let me tell you how this episode came to be. Several years ago, Amanda had coffee with Maria Vale at a conference, and Maria mentioned a book that she was sort of thinking about that sounded really cool. Fast forward about five or six years, and Molly Malloy and the Angel of Death is available to read. So Amanda and Maria and I got together to talk about the book, what it's like to write something that feels so risky and different and comes with warnings about HEA expectations. This becomes a conversation in a large part that is about the happy ever after, how it works and how it's interpreted by different readers. So I am very curious to hear your thoughts on this episode. I, of course, will have links to all of the books that we talk about in the show notes at smartpitches, trashybooks.com slash podcast. And hello to our Patreon community. I have a compliment this week. I love this to Michelle. You know how when it's a little cloudy and in the shade, it's chilly, but then the sun comes out from behind a cloud and it's pretty and it's bright and it warms you instantly. That is how you make your friends feel every day. If you would like a compliment of your own, or if you would like to support this here podcast, please have a look at patreon.com slash smart bitches. Every pledge helps me make sure that every episode has a transcript from Garlic Knitter. Hey, Garlic Knitter. And you keep me going week after week. It means a lot that you support the show. So thank you. And hello to Brittany, who is one of the newest members of our Patreon community. Support for this episode comes from Lumi. It is finally cooling off. It is no longer soup weather, thank goodness. But amid the fresh apples and the pumpkin spice, I myself would like to be freshly scented. And thankfully, Lumi deodorant makes it very easy to feel comfortable. And we have a special offer. New customers get $5 off Lumi starter pack with code Sarah30 at lumipodcast.com. That's L-U-M-E-P-O-D-C-A-S-T dot com. And use code Sarah30. The whole family over here really likes Lumi. I use the solid stick deodorant and it's great. The toasted coconut scent is really lovely. I don't ever have to think of it more than once a day. And I recently got the, oh, hey, you smell nice, like summertime, which is a nice compliment. Not only do I like Lumi, but my teenagers like it as well. One of my teens made off with a whole bunch of the things that I got in the starter pack, including the deodorant wipes. And the review was, hey, these really work and they don't smell weird. How does it work? Well, some products try to mask odor with a fragrance, but Lumi is formulated and powered by mandelic acid. So it stops odor before it starts, like a pre-odorant. Lumi can control odor for up to 72 hours. And it's a first of its kind product. It was designed to be safe to use anywhere on your body, even your feet. Lumi starter pack is perfect for new customers. It comes with a solid stick deodorant, cream tube deodorant, and two free products of your choice, like mini body wash and deodorant wipes, plus free shipping. As a special offer for listeners, new customers get $5 off a Lumi starter pack with code Sarah30 at lumipodcast.com. That equates to over 40% off your starter pack when you visit lumipodcast.com and use code Sarah30. 
All right. We're going to talk about death, candy, corn, and witches with Amanda and Maria Vale on with the podcast. Well, my name is Maria Vale. I write about, uh, you know, weird things, wolves, waitresses, death. Um, uh, I'm working on a new trilogy and I'm just really excited to be here. I am very excited to have you here. Hey, Amanda, who are you? (laughs) Hi, everyone. I'm Amanda. I um, have been on the site for a decade, I think 11 years this September. Yep. Uh, I know, right? <laughs> um, I feel like I don't need to do this anymore, do no, I? No, people know who you are. I'm just I'm just playing with you. Okay. I'm the person who puts the sales together. Yep. And that's really all you need to know. And Loki. Yeah, and I'm the person who buys from those sales, by the way. <laughs> Thank you very much. Listen, no I'm, problem. I am just as susceptible and it's my own damn website. <laughs> Buying books all the friggin' time. Um, I also will tell you, Amanda, I was doing some stat analysis earlier today, and this most, like most popular sections of the site are the main page, the book finder, and the book finder results. Every single book on sale for the last week, what you're reading, and hide your wallet. Like you have, you have, you have taken over like the top 10 (laughs) most popular pages. They are all Amanda work. We're just throwing books at you. That's really all it is. Like, there's this one and this one. And everybody's there to catch them. So, yeah. Everyone's there. And how many of them are there in the last 20 minutes? (laughs) There's going to be a lot. All right. So this podcast has come to be because, Amanda, you had coffee with Maria, who has told me this was at RT, not RWA, several years ago. And you learned about a book. (laughs) I think it was uh, when RT became BookCon. It was in New Orleans. Right, right. I still thought of it as RT at the time, but you're right. Same beast. Um, Yeah, this was the first book con in New Orleans. And I can't remember how many uh, wolf books had been out by then. I I think only two. I think there were only two. I think A Wolf Apart had come out. And, you know, they take so long to publish. You write (laughs) them and then you forget about them. And two years later, they come out. And I remember I really loved the those books and i really loved a promise of fire by amanda boucher and both maria and amanda or our source books authors and so i remember getting coffee with amanda and i think she was leaving the starbucks as maria was coming in um so we could have coffee and i remember just talking to maria and having a really great conversation and maria mentioned that she had this idea for a book And it was about death and this waitress. And she wasn't sure how it would go in terms of, you know, like having it get picked up because it's such a deviation from the wolves. And I thought it sounded really cool. And so you can imagine my surprise when like years later, probably like six, seven years later. It was, you know, I was writing all the other books in in between. So this was one of those things that whenever I found like, my editor was editing a book that I had turned in and you have these two weeks where you really, you should be getting started on the next one, but you're sort of like, okay, let me have a break. And so you'd sit there and write something else. And this was the something else. And I never really thought of it as, as you said, I never really thought of it as being pick upable because in a way it is a love story, but it's not, a romance and um and death as the, he's often portrayed in sort of more romantic uh stories is handsome and strong and all powerful and swaggering and my death was not my death was a sort of slim featureless guy who didn't fit in among the angels of heaven and didn't fit in on earth. And so, you know, he he lacked some of the alpha male qualities that one expects of the Grim Reaper. I, I always liked the idea of death as someone who's keeping you company as you go somewhere. They're not right. there to take your soul. They're not there to, you know, rip your soul out of your body or do anything like that. They're just going to take a walk with you. Or maybe you get to ride in a boat, depending on what legend you're in. 
Yeah, I, I actually did a series of um, about the my five favorite personifications of death, and they're all like that. And I think it's partly because I my my education was in medieval studies, which you know, oh, little obsessed that I had with death. no job. Yeah, a little obsessed <laughs> with death there too. Right. Well, and in the 14th century, especially, or the you had you had everything. You had the Black Death. You had all sorts of things going on. You know, Europe lost half of its population. And so you started to get these personifications of death in art. You had those that were sort of paired with demons Mm -hmm. and were simply evil. Then you had those that were sort of dancers. They were the ones who took your hand and danced you out of life. And they took you out whether you were a king or a pope or a, a serf, they took your hand and danced that last few lines with you. And I loved that. And I loved, just like I liked Death of the Endless from Sandman. I don't know if you've watched Sandman or if you read the comics, um, but Death of the Endless is a wonderful character. And she's like that. Wow. So you started talking about this book five years ago with Amanda at a coffee shop. And now it's here. But it sounds like this was an idea that was not going to let go of you. Like, it sounds like this had been sort of kicking around in what I call the crock pot in the back of your brain. where You toss an idea back there and then like five years later, a whole book comes out or like a whole blog. Sometimes that happens. Ask me how I know. But like, it just, you know, you toss things back there, it percolate for a while and then boom, here's a fully formed idea. You should write it down in a hurry. This usually happens when you're in the shower or driving. Was that the case? Was this an idea that would not let go? Yeah. And I wasn't sure where it was going. I, all I was sure of was two things. One was that death was this sort of character. And second was that this was about empathy Mm -hmm. and about learning empathy and about the everyday. And how glorious the everyday is. You know, often we write about sort of big things. We write about big events and great moral quandaries. And this was about the the beauty of the everyday. And to me, that was really important as to have that as a part of it. Now, I mean, that makes for a slightly weird arc, narrative arc, because you're not you're not really having this huge fight, this huge battle. There is a bit of a battle at the end, but really it's about teaching a love and respect for the everyday. And so it was, you know, again, odd little book. Was the writing process different for this than your prior books or was this a very similar process? I'm always fascinated by ideas that are just like, look, I, I will be born. You have no choice. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, it's completely different because you have you don't have deadlines. Oh, I like what those. is a book that you don't have deadlines, and that makes all the difference in the world. So, I have a deadline with source books for the Wolf books, and I also agreed to be in various um, anthologies or a couple of anthologies. Three. Um, that's a lot and, of anthologies, right? So you have to write those stories, and that's a very different kind of story because you're having to write something that has a completeness to it in a length that you're not used to. Yep. Right, exactly. And so those I had to write. And then I got around to sort of doing bits and pieces of this whenever I could. So it was always, I would have to read it from the beginning again and and go on from there. So I think it is a very different process when you do not have anybody expecting anything except possibly Amanda. (laughs) And you know, Amanda was going to be like, where's the book? Uh, I want to see it. (laughs) So in in a moment of great awesomeness, I did not plan this. We haven't actually said the name of the book yet. So we've been we've been recording for, you know, about 10 minutes now. I'm sure the finest finished audio will be shorter, but we haven't mentioned the book yet. And everyone's probably like, what's the book? Oh, my God. Just tell me what the book is. Okay, the the book is Molly Malloy and the Angel of Death. Yay! And it originally was going to be called Molly Malloy and the Rag Picker. But Rag Picker is what the angels call him because his, yes, what he does is not a high status job. So, but I, I, that turned out to be too confusing. I had a couple of people who said that was just too confusing. So 
I changed it around. All right. So tell me, what will readers find inside Molly Malloy and the Angel of Death? Molly is a young woman who's had way too much experience of death. She's had her parents died, her grandparents died, the first love of her life died. And she is sort of tough and wonderful and very resourceful. She ends up in New York and gets a job that pays reasonably well and has flexible hours while she studies to be an EMT. And that job is being a waitress at a restaurant on 34th Street. Restaurant, by the way. Restaurant. Get that restaurant. In there. But restaurant. <laughs> it's a restaurant right. of titties is what we're trying to say here. <laughs> exactly. And the first thing her boss tells her is to get a push-up bra because it will pay for itself in tips. So, you know, she's she's physical. She is a very physical being. And then death comes along and makes a mistake. He wasn't paying attention. And he takes her grandmother, who is in the hospital. This is not... I'm not giving away anything. It happens this, in the first three pages. This is all like early, but yeah, this is all right. very, this is like first right. chapter stuff. Yeah. So her grandmother's a shriveled, spiteful old being in a, in a hospital bed and he takes her by mistake and pats Molly on the back because she's choking on a chicken wing. And in so doing, he saves her and she becomes able to see him to talk to him, and she has no time for him. So much to (laughs) ask. But I want to start with with what happens before chapter one. Oh, there was a, there's a, like a, a warning of some sort (laughs) of like, this is, this is not a romance. Nope. So temper your expectations. But you mentioned before, it's like a love story. So was it kind of tricky given your history of writing conventional paranormal romances that have, you know, the HEA, the courtship to something that's a little bit more nebulous? Well, actually the reason I was very particular about this is I got a fair amount of blowback from one of my books, which I considered to have an HEA. I I know what book you're talking about. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I don't know. And, Did you? Was that an HEA? So I think every time I talk about this book, and I, I was it book three? I can never. I'm so bad with the names. Um, it, uh, Forever Wolf. Forever Wolf. Every time I talk about this book, and I have to give it a caveat of like, it is an HEA. It is not the HEA you want as the reader but is the HGA that character wants. Exactly. The definition of a happily ever after for that character is exactly what she gets. It might not be what we envision in our own minds or what we would want for ourselves or what we typically see, but in terms of living your life happily, what happens in the book is the definition of how the character would want to live out the rest of her life. So it right. is a bit of a, it's a bit of a mind fuck for sure, but like, I can see it from the reader's perspective, but if you look at it, like this, there was no other way this character would have been happy. Yeah. I mean, she may have been content. She may have pulled it off. I don't know, but, but no, I, and it was set up that way. Um, And, but I did get a lot of blowback from that. So I had people saying, you know, I'll never read another thing you've, Red and et cetera, et cetera. So I really wanted to be careful. I don't mean to mislead anybody. Um, but, you know, you've got a character who's immortal and a character who's not. If you look at it in the long term, it's not going to end ever after. And I, you know, I've been in conversations about Katrina Jackson's um, back in the day, which I absolutely, I love that book. And I think absolutely 
is a romance. Can you give a brief recap for anyone who hasn't read that book? It's really because it's a story that's being told by a father to his children of the way that the now deceased mother and he met. And it is gorgeous. The writing is beautiful. It's not that long. It's actually, you know, less than 200 pages, I think. But it's it's very real. And you feel this love. This is the love that lasts. It lasts past a lifetime. And it is then transmitted to the children of that love. And to me, that was just, you know, really beautiful. But I have been in, in arguments with people about how that is not an HEA. And I'm thinking, well, okay, so what constitutes an HEA? You all live together to be 95. You die at exactly the same minute. Or you don't die at all. Or you don't die at all. Yeah. Right. You both become vampires and it's all, it's all good. <laughs> or in the, in the, in the, in the mind of the reader, and this is a half-baked thought, so I haven't really cogitated on this one. I'll call you at three in the morning when I finish this whole brain idea. But <laughs> once these, once this synaptic pathway is complete, um, I think for some readers, and HEA comes with the idea that it doesn't end, that these characters won't die. And that because you can go back and reread the book, they're still there. And even if you see them in later books and it's a romance series, you know, they're fine. Like even in like, for example, the, the J.R. Ward series, there's a regular occurrence of all the wives coming out of the woodwork and all the other dudes coming out and they have a big, I don't know, they have a ball or something. I don't know. Just they all show up. <laughs> there are books in the Stephanie Lawrence series where the prior characters are all at a house party together. So you see them and they're older, but they're fine. The HEA for, I think for a lot of readers has no death. There's a Kate Noble book and I will have to look up which one it is. But it's bookended front and front and back matter by like the stories in the middle. And then this book ended by a diary entry from one of the characters. And you realize at the end that this this diary entry is being written after the partner has died. And so you finish the story. So the story ends and then it jumps ahead to finish that diary entry. Now, this is perfectly logical because the last time I checked, humans were mortal and they do die. <laughs> like that is a thing. It does happen. There's no escaping it. I remember reading that and being like, how dare you break my heart like this? They're not supposed to be dead. They're supposed to be happily ever after. It's in the name. There's no death. So I think that's part of it, even though it is rational and logical because we are not immortal, unless unless the characters are. Humans are not. So if you're writing about humans, the ever and the after is a significant amount of time here is what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's why I think we now have HFN. Yeah. But that does not seem to include mortality in the no in, in the construct. No. Love is forever. It's ever after. It's in the name. Yeah. <laughs> 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 so you've decided, all right, you're gonna write a book about death. <laughs> I can see why the warning was needed. I wanted it I, as I said, I wanted it to be about empathy, about he learns empathy because all he's ever seen of life is that moment when he plucks the soul out of the umphalos, the belly button, and sticks it in a pocket and goes about his business, mostly sort of stealing stuff, eating snacks. Um, you know, this is what he does. But then he's finally confronted with what life is. And it's this one particular life. And for him, it is an utter miracle, even though she is a kind of extremely mundane character. And he learns empathy. And in the end, that has a huge impact on the way, I, I'll go ahead and just say that the angels essentially purify souls when they gather them. And in the purifying, everything is erased. It's meant to make the world better. Mm -hmm. But in fact, it's a kind of institutional amnesia. Yes. Is that a good thing? Institutional amnesia? Or do we need to learn from our mistakes and from what we've done and from the things that have been good in our lives and the things that have been bad? And so that's sort of where this mess around <laughs> ends up. I, I think that makes a lot of sense, though, especially because of the idea of how many things we repeat. 
how many how many human experiences we keep doing this over and over like how many people drew for example a comparison between covid and the spanish flu right right like we to quote carl sagan we have traveled this way before and there is much to be learned <laughs> so you're thinking on like a, a grave scale and it just reminds me of like the repeating of bad decisions of Louis Black, the comedian, had this routine about candy corn. And every Halloween, he forgets how much he hates candy corn. And he's like, oh, candy corn, I'll try it, sure. And he, like, eats it. He's like, ugh, yuck, no. And then, like clockwork, every October, oh, candy corn. Maybe you should give it a try. And without fail, he thinks it's the most disgusting candy, but eats it every single year. I, for one, love candy corn, so... Not the okay, I, have a, candy. I have a story about candy corn because um, I hate candy corn. So <laughs> you can have all of taste. My, because it's basically just sugared wax, right? Yes. Love it. A hundred percent. So if I poured sugar in a candle and, you know, put it into a funny shape and handed it to you, you'd be fine. Oh, no, no, Mail no, it to no. me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but I had a friend who liked it and he said, uh, there's nothing like fresh candy corn. I said, fresh? <laughs> what is fresh candy corn? Organic. Think about candy corn candy that requires corn fresh from whole fresh foods. Food. Yeah. And he said, he said, yes, there is. There's a difference. So I took some candy corn that came in on my kid's bucket that nobody was going to eat. I put it in a little Mentos tin and left it there for a year. And the next Halloween, I had totally forgotten about it until next Halloween shows up. Again, we get candy corn. I said, oh, wait, where's that Mentos tin? And search around for it. And I get it. And they are shriveled little beans. There is a difference. There is fresh candy corn. So if, but if someone had told me that the world supply of candy corn was made in like 1910 and we just... (laughs) You know, we have all we need. I would have believed that as well, just because it is sugar and wax. Like we we made all we needed in the early 1900s and we just, you know, shovel it out every year. All I can tell you is that is a lie. It was not 1910 because one year in a Mentos tin is all it takes to turn that stuff into rock. Amazing. Uh, The more you know. Okay, just just a little behind the scenes. I can't laugh directly into my mic. It creates too big of a sound. And just now I was bent over on my desk, practically off camera, cry laughing. Okay. So now (laughs) I really am tempted to call this death and candy corn. That might be the name of this episode. Yeah. (laughs) Death and candy corn. (laughs) We can talk about witches too and make it a Halloween. Heck yeah. I mean, if you want to talk about witches, I am totally down. This is a great topic. (laughs) <laughs> I, 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 I've been reading a lot of witch stuff. I think, um, you know, I think it has to do with abortion rights. To Absolutely. Be no question. I agree with you. And, uh, you know, I read the Alex Harrow Once and Future Witches. Um, I'm reading the, well, I'm listening to The Year of the Witching as well. So good. I it's love so Alexis good. Henderson. I'm um, so also... Good. Reading, because I I listen and read. So I listen when I'm, you know, my hands are occupied. And then I'm reading something called The Heretic's Daughter by a woman named Kathleen Kent, who is actually the the umpteenth descendant of Martha Carrier, who was the first witch burned in Salem or executed in Salem. Whoa. And it is actually pretty terrifying because you get this, it's this incredibly claustrophobic sense of community. Yeah. And where any, any misstep can make you end up dead. (laughs) Um, And so I've, I've been, and then also for nonfiction, I think I may have mentioned it, Mona Chalet's uh, In Defense of Witches. Only the introduction is really about witches, but everything else is about how women do not fit, women who do not fit in with a sense sort of of utility mm-hmm. are considered witchy or out of the out of the norm. So if you're not 
fertile enough, if you're too old, if you're, uh, if you are not, uh, if you're not acquiescent, if you're not, there are all sorts of ways in which you are not useful enough. And then you become suspect. It's really good. Wow. My brain is like, I need to go and read that now. <laughs> Which is really interesting because I think there's a couple of major strains of witch fiction right now. There was just an article on Tor.com about the very white supremacist narrative inside a lot of the small town witch romances. You okay over there? Got a lot of jumping cats over here. <laughs> um, that there's a, there's a large amount of white supremacist messaging. There's a lack of diversity in a lot of the towns. And there's also the whole idea that if you are, if part of the conflict is that you can't marry somebody who doesn't have magic blood. Okay, that's miscegenation. Ooh, I, yeah. yeah, like, oh, okay, yikes. So there's a there's a couple of different strains of witch romances and witch books, especially witch fiction. And then there's the kinds that will just absolutely scare the pants off of you. Right. And I'm I'm here for those. I'm here for those. Though even I have to say, sometimes like this one, this uh, heretic's daughter is is making me a little panicky. <laughs> yeah. Very anxiety inducing, but also it's very anxiety inducing to currently be a human with a uterus in some states. You know, like that anxiety is real and writing that into horror make and, and into fiction makes a lot of sense. I do have one question about your book to go back to it just a little bit. Did you, did you watch Pushing Daisies? No, I didn't. Okay. So Pushing Daisies was a show that was a casualty of the last writer's strike. Speaking of things that we haven't learned yet, um, and that we keep doing over again. <laughs> the last writer's strike, um, Pushing Daisies was a casualty of that strike. I don't think it ever came back. I don't know if it was ever finished, but the but the premise of the of the series, and it's got Lee Pace and it's like Technicolor. Kristen Chenoweth is in it. If you can find it, it is some amazing, visually stunning television. Like it's a shame that it didn't get to finish. But anyway, the premise is that Lee Pace's character can touch someone and bring them back from the dead. But if he touches them again, they will die. And mm. he rescues from death someone that he has a massive crush on, that he has strong feelings for. He brings her back to life. But this means he can never touch her again or she will die. Oh, wow. And he also has a, there's like a pie bakery going on. Like it, there are so many elements that you see in that show that you can see spreading out into different directions. It's a very influential show that when you see it, you're like, hold the phone. That's where that came from. So there's a lot of similarity there, I think, because death is like, oh, well, shit, you're my biggest fuck up and the thing that makes me feel happy. Well, crap. Right. And so he has to fight for her. Yeah. He has to he has to stand up for her. I mean, he has an ally. Mm -hmm. He has one single friend, one single ally, which is B or Miriam. And um she luckily is a very powerful ally. So uh, she can sort of stand up for him and help him fight against the, it, all the forces that are trying to make him off Molly yeah. and fix his mistake. He's, he's got that. But yes, no, there's this, there's this constant pressure to fix it. Yeah, because she is a mistake, even though for him, she is not a mistake. Right. Right. For him, she's a miracle. So, you know, this is, and, and a miracle is a mistake. You know, a miracle is something you're not expecting. Right. Right. So to me, a miracle, it often is a mistake. Was there any particular movies or TV shows or, or media that inspired or influenced Molly Malloy? Other than your history as a medievalist, where death is real, real common. I'm trying to think. I mean, I read a lot of these kinds of books where you have this kind of gentle, Psychopomp, Death, The Book Thief. Yeah. Again, Neil Gaiman. And, oh, and of course, Terry Pratchett is just sort of the king of imagination. And his death is wonderful. It's just wonderful. And if you have not read Terry Pratchett, then I envy <laughs> anybody who's not read Terry Pratchett. That's definitely an author I feel like we've seen a lot of, of like, what's the one person you wish you could read again for the very first For the first, first time. time, absolutely. But I read him again over and over, and not just sort of the the big ones. I've read all of the Mort ones quite a few, the Mort Death, Grim Reaper quite a few times, or Reaper Man, rather. But I've also read 
like all the uh, the ones about the young witches, who which are funny. And oh, now I've forgotten her name. Tiffany Aching. Yes, thank you. Amanda, I would like mad praise for remembering a name very quickly from my memory. Like I, that never happens. Amanda is the I memory am, bank, not me. <laughs> so good. So good. Um, yeah, no, Tiffany Aching. I love those books. She, her grandmother, the whole setup yeah. is wonderful. So Amanda, what are your questions? Yeah, I want to I want to know what's next. Maria mentioned a trilogy and I'm um so what, I'm right what can you say? Well, what I can say is I haven't done an elevator pitch. So, bad on me. Um but I mean, you just have your name and a trilogy and that's the pitch <laughs> like Oh, that's it for me. Oh. Um <laughs> But the premise is basically that we've always rooted for the wrong people in uh, in Twilight of the Gods. In Ragnarok, the gods are the worst. Because let's face it, you have a pantheon, which is based on violence. You have four gods of war, a god of songs about the valorous dead. You have a hall that's devoted to the valorous dead. You actually have two halls devoted to the Valorous Dead because Frigg has her own hall of Valorous Dead. And then you have a field for the Valorous Dead. So it's all about war and bloodshed and violence. And to to me, the other side is much more intriguing and much more interesting. And I sort of imagine Yggdrasil, as a dryad, almost, who has been tormented by the gods, and she is sick and tired of it. Anyway, it will become clearer when we have an elevator, bitch. Gore and greed and gold is not a good basis for any kind of religion. And yet... (laughs) And yet... Speaking of things we have not learned from. Yeah. And if your religion isn't based on gore and greed and gold, you get blamed for being being motivated by those things, even though that's not actually part of the theological underpinnings. <laughs> so either way, you're going to get hit with the gore and the gold and the greed. It's all there. Sorry. Forget it. What is the next thing that comes out for you? Is it one of the anthologies? Is it a book? What's next on your publishing um, schedule? I think... Uh, well, right now I have a book for an anthology with Jeffy Kennedy and Grace Draven. Ooh. But Grace has been having some health problems. So it's it's not a secret. It's no. not a yeah, secret. There was a GoFundMe, I think. Oh yeah. For, yeah, there was a GoFundMe well, and and uh so I think that's on hold. Yeah. For right now. I've pretty much written it, but uh, I think that should be the next thing that comes out, depending on on how Grace is doing. So tell us, please, what books are you reading that you would like other people to know about? Okay. We've mentioned uh, a lot. So if you're you're fresh out of the names of books, <laughs> that's okay. I understand. No, I, no, I actually, can I, since I've talked about what I'm reading now already, can mm-hmm. I just mention a couple of the books that I am looking forward to that maybe you guys have already read? I'm sorry, we're not allowed to do that on this show. Yes, please. (laughs) (laughs) I'm really looking forward to Kingfisher, T. Kingfisher's Thorn Hedge. I love books. Yes. I really want to read this. So pumped for that one. Yeah, so pumped. Um, uh, The Witch King by Martha Wells. Yep. Which I have, again, I've read none of these. So it's not, these are not my (laughs) recs, but these are things that I'm just sort of thinking, okay, I may actually pay a full price. <laughs> Good. The Witch King, I thought, was... So, you know, I'm a, I am have read Murderbot, like, many, many times. Like, I've lost count of the number of times I've read right. that series. And so I went in knowing this is not Murderbot, this is not science fiction, this is very much fantasy. As I've also read the Roxura books, which are, whoa, Ooh. fantasies. Have you read those? No. Matriarchal, polyamorous, winged, scaled dragon creatures. Oh my gosh! <laughs> Who live in trees? Like it's okay. A whole full thing. price. It is. 
it is a whole thing. And I'm like, yeah, okay. Yep. I, you've got me with these winged patriarchal or matriarchal polyamorous dragon people. Like, yeah, let's do it. Like, I get it. And there's, there's one particular, um, you're in the, in the rock Sora world, you can shift, but most of the time you're born into a certain, uh, type of rock Sora. And that is, that will inform the job that you have in the community. And there are some that basically it's a it's a lost princess story, and mm-hmm. the the characters who are the same as the lead character they are that type. They will continue to grow and grow and grow until they are frigging mammoth. So there is this one character who is just funk stomping <laughs> everywhere. It, it, it is wild. So anyway, I went in thinking, okay, I'm going to lean more towards wingy people than than robots. The Witch King is is so interesting because it starts off with a character who is in a box and has no body and doesn't understand what they're doing there. And then they have to like, it's like the world's most arduous to-do list. All right, now I got to find a body. Okay, now I got to keep the body going. All right, what body is this? Do, is this body? Well, I got to go get another body. All right, how did I end up in a box? Who put me in a box? Who harmed my friend? Like, it's just this, it, the to-do list just goes. And Martha Wells is so good at writing characters who are really just trying very hard to organize all of this annoying chaos. And I think that's why I like her book so much. There's got to be a way if I tick off this one thing and people will just call, no, nope, no, nope, here's another person with a sword. Damn it. Yeah. <laughs> it's a, it's really, really good. Oh, I can't, well, I can't wait to read it. I mean, I don't think it's out yet. Is or The is Witch it- King? No, The Witch King, I'm pretty sure is out. There's okay. a new right. um there's a new murder bot, I want to say November. Okay. Yeah, okay. the Witch King the Witch King is out as of May 30th of 2023. Okay. Thank you, Google. First Google of the episode. It's very late for me. Yes. Any um, other books also, you want to mention? Yeah, I should have looked me, that up. Please but, tell me all of them. Um, then there's God Killer by oh. Hannah Kaner, which looks good to me. It's a fantasy. And then there's a uh, Clytemnestra by, uh, I want to remember her name. Um, is it Jennifer? Cassati is her last name. Cassati, oh. C-A-S-A-T-I. Um, and I have always loved, my, one of my favorite movies as a teenager was Iphigenia by Kekoyanis. And in the end of that, there's an image of Irene Pappas as the wind blows in. Her daughter has been sacrificed for the wind. The wind blows in and all you see is this one black eye as her hair blows across her face. And you know her husband is dead. That Agamemnon is dead. And it's such a brilliant movie. It's so beautiful. So a book about Clytemnestra has my name written all over it. That is, as we like to say, your house of wheels. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Maria, where can people find you if you wish to be found? <laughs> okay. If things are in flux right now, aren't they? So Yes, sure are. <laughs> uh, yeah. So I'm, I'm still on Instagram. I don't really do Facebook. Twitter, I am bowing out of. I'm on Blue Sky. Ooh, yay. And uh, on threads to a lesser extent, but on threads. Thank you so much for doing this interview. It is so cool to hear that you you guys had coffee like five years ago and now the book is here. <laughs> uh, yeah. And I have to say, knowing that Amanda was there and that I had actually spoken these words to somebody helped me keep on task. So thank you, Amanda. And that brings us to the end of this week's episode. Thank you to Maria Vale for hanging out with us. And thank you to Amanda for remembering the conversation that she had all these years ago. This is not a surprise for Amanda. She remembers everything. I don't remember things very well at all. I am really curious, though, about your expectations for an HEA. Do you have the reader expectation that a happily ever after is forever? Like death has no place in an HEA or not? I did mention that I would give some spoilers about the end of the book. So... Here's what happens at the end of Molly Malloy and the Angel of Death. Molly has to die. She's mortal. But then at the very end, someone else recognizes death and he realizes that he has found her 
soul. Sort of like knight in shining armor, right? My soul will find yours. It's like that. So I'm curious about your thoughts about the AGA. Please, please tell me. You can find me online. You can find me on the website at smartbitchestrashybooks.com slash podcast under episode number 581. I would really love to know what you think because this is something that I think about a lot, actually. How expectations affect how we write and understand romance. I will link to all of the books that we talk about in the episode in the show notes. Never fear. Oh my goodness, I almost forgot the joke. I can't do that. This joke comes from Laura B. in the Discord. Hello, Laura. What do you call a chicken crossing the road? What do you call a chicken crossing the road? Poultry in motion. (laughs) Thank you, Laura. (laughs) On behalf of everyone here, have a great weekend and have wonderful books to read. Smart Podcast Trashy Books is part of the Frolic Podcast Network. You can find more outstanding podcasts to subscribe to at frolic.media slash podcasts. Seriously, Clay, watch out for the cows. ACAST powers the world's best podcasts. Here's a show that we recommend. What is The Briefing Room? It's a behind-the-scenes look at how the criminal justice system works and the lives of the people within that system. If you love true crime, well, these are the real people who do the job every day of making sure justice is served. Hi, I'm Detective Dave. I'm Detective Dan. Together, we have decades of experience in local law enforcement, a profession that we think is often misunderstood. So we're going to explore how to do it right, and we won't shy away from when it's done wrong. These are stories you'll hear nowhere else. Unique, frank, and unvarnished. From the team that brought you Small Town Dicks, this is The Briefing Room. Episode 1 drops on August 30th. We'll meet you in The Briefing Room. ACAST helps creators launch, grow, and monetize their podcasts everywhere. ACAST.com.